CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, joined here by Jonah Bronstein of Bronstein Sports Plus. And right off the, you know what, uh, let me quickly say, uh, for those uh, tuning in and obviously expecting some Don Granado talk, what's going on with the Buffalo Sabres, I don't know, maybe touch on the uh, Buffalo Bills and the draft um, now that they are uh, in uh, voluntary workouts right now. They're back and around, although we haven't had any media access yet. We don't uh, get to talk to them until Thursday, and we're recording this on Wednesday. Uh, we'll get to all that. Uh, but uh, we had a tight window with our first guest, and we wanted to pounce on it because it is fascinating. Uh, we're joined by Patrick Tierney. He's a student at Buff State, used to attend Mercyhurst. He was just telling us that his setup is not because he's a podcaster. I made it that he's into music, to which he's got a microphone set up there. And I made a two turntables and a microphone reference. And he did talk about his turntables. Patrick, you were saying you're, you're kind of like the DJ at Mercyhurst. Does that play or the party guy? I don't know. I mean, if you got all this set up, does mm. that factor in why you're no longer at Mercyhurst? You know, um, I, it might have a little something to do with it. So I I did play club hockey there. And if there's one thing about club hockey, it's you could play hockey and also have fun at the same time. It's not as serious as, you know. Oh, right, NCAA. because the kids on the team aren't allowed. They, they, they're they too pure. Yeah, that's I understand. a good, good word to use. But um, we uh, we had our basement set up, and the way that it was post-COVID – was everything was so strict so all the ncaa teams didn't want to get caught or nothing so our house was kind of the prime spot for people to group up on weekends and i had bought dj turntables taught myself how to so i would dj for like eight hours in one night just straight for these parties every weekend it was it was just pretty ridiculous but that might have something to do with why I transferred. I see. Well, that sounds like a proving ground for why you are uh, appearing on uh, Tim Graham and Friends. Um, Patrick Tierney, and you don't know the name because he had used a burner account for this. Yep. He recently did, accomplished, achieved, completed the, what I'll refer to as the 9 9 and 9 challenge at an Arizona Diamondbacks game while out there on spring break with his family. And he posted his feet uh, under Matt Molson Canadian Lager, MMCL 69. Of course, you have to have a 69 in there. You have to. Um, his feet of, well, you got, you've gotten 10 million views under your burner account. You're now emerging to claim your status. So explain to the folks what the nine nine and chat nine nine and nine challenge is and why people are losing their shit that you did it. Yeah. So I feel like if this was just me telling my friends that I had did this, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But for some reason, on a whim, I had posted that I was doing it in the middle of it. And so it's basically you just have to drink a beer, eat one hot dog for every single inning for all nine innings of the baseball game while you're there. So I posted this, didn't really think anything of it. I was in the middle of the game. I was drinking, eating the hot dogs, put my phone away. And then we get in the car after we're leaving and we're stuck in the Phoenix traffic. And I look at my phone and I have like 
5 million views off on this one tweet and I'm going through all the replies and people have like never heard of it before. And how many followers does this burner account have right now? I think it has like eight, 40 maybe i think and at the but time before, probably a fraction of that How, yeah before i had posted that it had like 500 what was the catalyst was there any one site that retweeted you or how did you get out there into the into the world i honestly have no idea because so the dude was they think you were actually replied, matt Molson? that, that would have been funny if they did think i was matt Molson. i don't think so i mean he did follow me which was funny the real Matt Molson. So I wonder what he thinks of that account. But um, I don't think any notable people retweeted it, but I did have Bleacher Report reach out to me, ask if they could post it. And I said, yes. And then they never did. So I thought that was a little strange too. How are we to believe that this actually happened? I know the background of this, but I'm walking you through it. So you can explain to everybody. Cause I think the first question would be, how do we know this guy really did it? All right, yeah, so that was a lot of the replies, too, was either people not believing me or saying it was too easy. But I did it with my sister's boyfriend, so we both did the challenge together, and the rest of my family was there. They can all vouch. I mean, not to say that people are attacking me saying I didn't do it. I mean, if they think that, then I don't care. I know I did it, but. It's, all right, so then the next question would be, I guess the first question before that, because we want to make sure these aren't Vienna sausages and oh, yeah, yeah. like uh, splits, OV splits. Mm. Um, what uh, what was the setup? What was the hot dog situation? What was the beer situation? So the first inning, before the game actually started, actually, we, um, me and my sister's boyfriend both got a 24-ounce uh, lining kugel. But once the game had started, we opted to not count that since – Obviously, that felt like cheating. So we bought the 16-ounce draft Coors for every inning, and the vendors closed at the seventh inning, so we had to buy a few extra just so we would have some for the eighth and ninth. And once we had both eaten four hot dogs each, we went to a hot dog stand and bought 10 total just so we would have them. So my sister has a video of me running up the steps carrying 10 hot dogs like – a running back just sprinting up the stairs so i mean it was, it was quite the task but i mean i you got put it. anything on the hot dogs no just plain i didn't want any extra I, I didn't want anything else in my stomach other than what i needed to put in for the challenge well because you're you an them in the water like uh joey chestnut <laughs> I, I someone was telling me about that like why didn't you do that but that just sounds so gross soggy bread soggy hot dog and how, for lack of a better phrase, how has your, uh, um, how's your boiler room been, uh, or how was it uh, for the next couple of days? Um, that night it was pretty rough, but I mean, after that, it wasn't really that bad. The things you'll do for 10 million views. And you didn't even know you were getting it. That's the dedication no. there. You didn't even know. You weren't saying, I'm doing this for viral internet mm -mm. fame. You just said, no, I'm doing was... this because I'm a competitor. I was just putting it into the void. I, I have that Twitter account solely to just tweet whatever. I mean, there's some lewd stuff on there, whatever. But it's basically for the reason that I just want to tweet whatever's in my brain. All right. Well, that's actually interesting that you say that. Uh, because joining us uh, right now on Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK CPAs and Business Consultants, is uh, Buffalo uh, former oh, Buffalo man. Sabres forward Matt Molson. Oh, uh, who has a couple of things uh, that he needs to say. He's actually on vacation. All right, and uh, he says he's joining us here. Um, Although the way he's dressed right now, I would have to say, Matt, <laughs> are we sure that that's really you? Uh, is this an imposter? You got it. Well, I got I got a little sunburn on the uh, on the shoulder, so I got the uh, the sweater on right now. I see. Well, Matt, we just got done talking to uh, Patrick Tierney here about uh, his nine nine and nine challenge under your name, by the way, uh, and that he does also post some lewd things under this. Uh, 
under this account that he's not necessarily proud of. And so I thought it would be uh, important for the sake of, um, you know, accountability. I mean, it's a big thing in hockey, accountability, that uh, that you get a chance to come on and, and uh, confront uh, young Patrick here about uh, what he's been up to. Well, I will say the bio of my of the Twitter says not related, not affiliated with the real Matt Molson. <laughs> I, I think originally I was going to come on and uh, I don't think I'm a good actor. I was going to come on and yell at him. And but uh, <laughs> I think I think he says a lot of things that are, are, are pretty funny that maybe uh, sometimes after a couple of adult beverages, maybe I would probably tweet out. So uh, yeah. I, I get a big kick out of, out of uh Looking at him, I think he's probably made me more famous than my hockey made me. So uh, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Matt, thanks for doing this. I thought it would be a nice little twist. Um, here, you made a mark in Buffalo. And, of course, you have the name that has a bit of a um, uh, a, par a party twist to it in, it in its own self. You know, Molson. You know, Molson. Canadian lager, as he says on his burner account. Uh, I'm sure that your name gets misspelled a lot because people want to leave that you out. They're so used to staring at that can. Um, has Molson brought you or did it bring you a certain extra uh, hockey fame while you were playing? I mean, I wish it did. I think it uh, would have pumped up my credibility a little bit. So, but uh, no, not really. I think. Um, I was hoping for that, but to be honest with you, when I was younger, I was always a little bad guy. So um, I teamed up with Crown Royal in, in Buffalo for uh, Wounded Warriors, but uh, unfortunately, Molson, they, they, they never reached out. I couldn't get in touch with them, so couldn't, couldn't partner up with them. But um, everyone always asks me if I'm the heir to the Molson fortune, but uh, unfortunately, I have no blood relation to Jeff Molson. Um, so uh, I just have to stick with stick with the Molson with the U and uh, make it the hard way. I think that Larry Labatt probably would have had some sponsorship uh, if, <laughs> had he played in the National Hockey League. I'm obviously there probably maybe there is a Larry Labatt out there. I'm just making up a name. But <laughs> anybody with the it's last name, name Labatt or Jack Budweiser might uh, obviously uh, do something too. Um, Patrick, uh, well, I, I told Matt we were going to have a little hockey conversation. Um, what would you like to ask Matt Molson? Now that you have him here in front of you. Oh man. No, I have I, I haven't done the nine nine. I'm I'm waiting for the nine nine challenge. <laughs> you, you gotta get it done. A, a golf challenge, maybe like uh nine nine holes, nine beers, nine hot dogs. That's like a, a Bob does sports kind of thing going I, on. I there. can I could deal with that. I like that. All these people that think I invented it, they keep tweeting at me. The one guy said, Do eighteen beers, eighteen dogs, eighteen holes, and I just I mean, I don't that sounds like a, yeah, a bit much. Yeah, that, yeah that, that sounds like a reach. I think that yeah. uh, maybe Fat Perez on Bob does sports. He might be able to do <laughs> yeah. that one. But I, anyway, anyone else? I don't. I don't know if they have a chance. Yeah. But if you did a nine, nine, and nine on the golf course, though, that would be a condensed version. That would be even more hellish. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I could do the nine holes, nine beers. I think the nine hot dogs would uh, would trip me up. I think I would the, need the hot food. dogs. They really start to get you around like the sixth <laughs> inning. They just start tasting like nothing. And uh, it's, it was terrible. Yeah. That's a Joey Chestnut type. Uh, yeah. Type beat there. What's like a, a normal baseball inning. How long do they last usually? So the one that I went to, it depended. Like there was a few that went on a while. And then the seventh inning, I think it was just went one, two, three outs, one, two, three outs. So I had to drink that beer and the hot dog and like, Five minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. I was gonna say, like the golf yeah. holes are like. I mean, you could walk and do it like a twenty-minute hole. That's that's not bad. Yeah. In golf, you can also slow yourself down because you're the one playing the sport. So you could probably um, massage uh, the time. You know, mm -hmm. you could. Yeah. Ac you could accidentally hit one. You know, into the woods and go disappear for a little bit. How yeah, many well, bathroom like, breaks were you able to work in here, Patrick, by the way? I mean, especially, you know, the phrase break the seal. All us guys yeah. who've had a few beers knows uh, what breaking the seal means. And once you did break the seal, uh, uh, what was the, uh, what kind of pace were we talking here? So I don't think I broke the seal until the seventh inning. I think I was doing a pretty good job holding it in because I knew what was coming if I did. 
And then I think after I did break the seal, I took like three more trips in the two innings yeah. that were left. How close that's, were that's you to the I, men's room? Um, it was pretty close. It was because we were in the 300. It was a Wednesday um, noon game, so it wasn't that crowded. So it was just a quick walk. The the worst part was walking up all those stairs because we were in the last row. Yeah, I was gonna say that's the hard part. That's the hard part taking that time away from the hot dog and beer drinking yeah. to go to the bathroom. Then you got to really shove them down. Yep. You could do, uh, I once heard this, I, I've talked to him about it. I guess I could confirm it, but how do you broach this, uh, you know, topic? But I was told that infamously, uh, Dick Vermeil, the former uh, Philadelphia Eagles, Rams, and Chiefs football coach. Um, well, Matt, you follow football. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I'm telling you, just because you, you know, Dick Vermeil. So he, uh, to say he was such a, um, such so organized with his time, that he actually would eat while on the toilet to save the time. Uh, so that is like the quintessential, you're taking this too far. Uh, but you could have done that, Patrick. You could have actually been eating while going to the bathroom or ch chugging your beer while at the urinal to save time. Yeah, I think the the beer at the urinal is fine. But if I was in the stall eating a hot dog, I think I might be crossing <laughs> some boundaries there. <laughs> Some sanitary yeah. problems. Hey, yeah, I was gonna say the, the beer is probably all right. The, the hot yeah. dog in the bathroom, maybe that's that's a little much. That's, yeah, Matt, what did you think when you first heard this? Uh, my buddy actually texted my buddy texted me a picture of it. Uh, John Bosco, he's like, "Is this you?" I was like, "No," but it's pretty funny. And then I started looking at the the account, and I was laughing. And uh, I actually liked one of Patrick Patrick's tweets. He he tweeted out so. Uh, that was my, my way of giving them a thumbs up that, uh, uh, I, I enjoyed following them. Yep. Now I went out to Southern California to do a story on Matt uh, a few years ago, and I don't think he followed me back. So the respect, <laughs> now I know what you need to do to get Matt Molson's respect. <laughs> you, you needed a couple more late night tweets. I would have been following <laughs> you right away. <laughs> well, if you followed my account, uh, you'd, uh, you'd probably be, uh, uh pleased uh, with what you saw. If that's your, if that's your basis, um, Matt, can we talk a little hockey here? Absolutely. All right. So you're out of the game, uh, after a, a incredible career, um, the Sabres just fired another coach yesterday, uh, and you joined the team. Dan Bilesma was the coach or no, Ted Nolan was the coach. I'm sorry. That is the coach you signed. You were traded. Uh, you were traded here. Wanted to come yeah, back. Traded. Signed yeah. an extension to play for Ted Nolan and Pat Lafontaine. Um, although I think Tim Murray was kind of involved there too, uh, with the yeah, extension. But then things just kind of went sideways, and the team still hasn't been able to figure it out since you signed that uh, extension back in 2016, I believe it was. So we're talking about a one, two, three, four, five, the sixth coach in since you joined the team in 2015. What what do you when you hear that the, the Sabres still haven't been able to figure it out? And I know you have fond memories about Western New York. What comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's. You know, sometimes it's tough to get players there, but once they're there, they love living there. I mean, I loved living in Buffalo, love the people, love the, the sports passion. Um, you know, I love Teddy Knoll, and that was a big reason why I, I, I resigned and wanted to play there for him. Um, you know, I think they have great players. They've, they've had great players. They've got rid of some I – mean, Samson Reinhardt's having a heck of a year. <laughs> Eichel wins a cup, O'Reilly wins a cup. I mean, they had great players. I think it's, uh, you know, while you're there, they, you see Tortorella, whether you love him or hate him, he creates a culture that everyone buys into, uh, especially at the beginning. And, and maybe it doesn't last because he's such a, a hard coach over time. But in the beginning, he gets everyone to buy in. And that's something, you know, I think Buffalo, Buffalo needs. They need uh, to develop this winning culture. And it's just been... You know, so many years the Pagulas spend a lot of money and time into put a lot of money and time into the team, and I think just getting that that right coach that's going to develop that culture of a, a winning culture and doing it the right way is is a big thing. Obviously, I, I haven't had any of these coaches after me, so I, I can't speak to them. But 
um, from an outsider looking in on a, on a team that you want to do well, you always cheer for. Uh, best friends with Kyle Posto is always cheering for him to do well when he was there. And, uh, you know, I think they maybe let some good people go. Marcus Polino is a close friend of mine who's uh, become an unbelievable player for, for Minnesota. Uh, Samson, obviously, Jack. And it, it's, it's sad to see because those guys, you think – all those guys on a team with some of the guys that they have now, obviously there's a lot of trades that went on, would be a, a pretty darn good hockey team. So um, it, it's tough when there, when there's turnover like that to uh, develop one, I guess, vision. And it's been a couple of different visions throughout the years. So I think some, something stable to create a culture is a big thing that they probably need right now. So you mentioned John Tortorella. You know, there's a, you know, Lindy Ruff is available and I know that you missed him, uh, but in your time in Buffalo, I'm sure it was known to you what uh, the fans thought of him and the success that he had. I mean, he's the, un unfortunately for him at this point, he's the greatest coach to never win the Stanley Cup in terms of all the records, in terms of most wins and winning percentage and playoff appearances and all that stuff. Um, I don't know. I mean, can you spitball? Like, can you put your put yourself as a fan because you're no longer in the game. What are some coaches out there that come to mind as, as who might be, uh, who might be worth taking a, a spin? No, I would have, I mean, a year ago, I would have loved Andrew Burnett. I had him in, in Minnesota as a power play coach. I, I loved his, his view on the game. Um, I don't, I don't know right now. I think uh, I'll probably have to, to wait and see who, who who's there. I mean, my probably my favorite coach I've ever had playing in pro hockey was Spencer Carberry, and Washington ended up hiring him and getting to the playoffs. Uh, he, he's he was he was an unbelievable coach, unbelievable person. I was uh, uh, able to I scouted with the Leafs for a year, and he was there. But uh, I, I'd say you know some of some of the young guys coming up, I probably don't even know about would be would be would be options that have have some strong views. But I think they definitely need someone with a a strong view on the culture and, and, and turn this team to a winning winning playoff team because that's that's the type of players they have on the team. They have some unbelievable players. Can you tell us at all from your time in the NHL how and why coaching matters or why maybe a coaching change can bring out a better version of a team that if they don't make a lot of roster moves? Um, I mean, I could speak personally. I think it's just uh, an honesty thing. I think the coaches I haven't got along with well and played well under are just uh I don't think they're very honest to you I think if it, when you're when you're a professional athlete all you want is someone to tell you the truth how you're playing bad good why what can I do to change it to help to get better I think that's number one foremost um I think just the day-to-day -day interaction is a, is a huge thing in today's game obviously with all the young guys I think that's a a big thing and uh you know, it's a little different than maybe how it was. Uh, so I think that interaction is, is key to, to helping young players become better and understand what what's necessary for them to win games and be successful in the NHL. And, the, you know, if you're not honest with guys from the start, they're, it's a tough, uh, a tough road to create a, a winning culture. You are in a little bit of a sweet spot here, Matt, in terms of uh, maybe bridging my ignorance and what I used to know about hockey. Now, I don't cover hockey nearly as much as I used to. Um, I covered uh, the National Hockey League uh, up until 2007, uh, and then I started covering the NFL. And while I have covered some hockey, now that I'm back with the athletic, I'm still mostly a football writer. So Matthew Fairburn, uh, the Athletics uh, Sabres beat writer, was on paternity leave uh, in December, and I filled in for him on the beat. And one of the first games I covered was the nine to, not, what was the score? Nine to two. Patrick, you might remember. Nine to four. Nine to four loss to the Columbus Blue Jackets. It was one of the most atrocious games I'd ever seen, and Columbus was one of the worst teams in the league at the time. And I go down there to the locker room. And I walk in the locker room and there is, there are five people at their stalls. Kyle Ocposo being one of them is the captain. There are no defensemen in the locker room. Uh, and the other players were like, 
I, I don't remember specifically. I remember Casey Middlestat was one of them, but then guys who didn't play necessarily much, not people who should be sitting in there answering these questions. And so I asked Don Granado about, you know, whatever happened to that everybody sitting at their stalls after one of those ass kickings, you know, that I'm sure you've been a part of one or two of those. That used to be a thing. And so I've been, I've been a, bu- a bunch with the Islanders and the Sabres. So, yeah, I've been, right. I've been- so I talked to Kyle a couple of days later, Kyle had to sit there and answer all the questions. And uh, I thought that was unfair because I think that a team should, you know, when a moment like that, everybody's got to take, and I've used this phrase before their bite of the shit sandwich. Mm-hmm. And it was expressed to me that it just doesn't happen anymore. It just, it isn't like that anymore. Uh, and I thought, well, that's a shame. And then we found out later in the season, uh, Tortorella did that with the flyers after a game, even the scratches were in the locker room. Now I'm not, I'm using that just as an anecdote, yeah. but Matt, how do you think things have changed in terms of accountability and a coach? Like how, uh, there used to be, all right, Tortorella is at the extreme, but there used to be six or seven Tortorella type guys in the league up until relatively recently. You even wonder is Lindy Ruff a dinosaur, but he, and he was a little more clever with how he was a micromanager and, and really, you know, an accountability guy. What happened to accountability? And where did it go? Does it have its place in hockey? Is it, do we need more of it? I, I, the floor is yours. Um, I think that's a good question for general society as well, but uh, uh, accountability. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I came into the league under Mark Crawford. He was my first coach. So you want to talk about accountability. He was, uh, he was right up there with uh, Mr. Tortorella. Um, but it was him and Dean Lombardi. You know, my career didn't, end up blossoming with the Kings, with the Islanders. But it, it was the lessons I learned under those two who were who were uh, extremely important to me, Dean Lombardi especially. I, I mean, I don't know how many conversations I had in his office, uh, but there was a bunch. But he uh, he always held you accountable. Trying to, and his whole reasoning was trying to turn you into a winner, to, to, to let you know that things didn't come easy, that, Things had to be earned. I think that's, you know, how I grew up was nothing came easy. Nothing came easy for me in hockey. It was always, okay, you had a poor showing. You stunk that game. Work harder. You want to be better? Work harder. And I think uh, too often now it's too much runway maybe for for people because maybe sometimes we're scared of, of, of hurting someone's feelings, but in reality it's, it's the truth and you're trying to help them and make them better. I think, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to coach my, my son's team with my brother-in-law and we try to hold the kids accountable, not, not based upon uh, their production or performance, but more different work ethic stats that we keep to, to let them know that this is, this is how we're going to win. It's not the, the end product isn't the thing. I think, Too many times people are looking at the end product when they're not looking at the work that has to go in to get there. So uh, that could, that uh, maybe, maybe paired with uh, being maybe sometimes scared to give someone the actual truth is, is what's kind of, what's kind of happening. And you see those coaches that are able to balance it. You know, you don't have to be an asshole. You just have to be able to engage and explain those, those truths. And I think sometimes we lose that accountability can be a vague term or a concept maybe uh to you matt what does accountability look like now you just mentioned the things that accountability should bring or that you want mm-hmm. but can you give an example when people say account accountability there's uh, you give fans whether it be on social media even some members of the media who say we accountability 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 but then they can't define define it or tell you what it's how it's supposed to um perpetuate what would be What's accountability to you? I mean, accountability is you're getting, you're getting paid a lot of money to play to play a sport you love, and I think accountability starts off the ice, making sure you're preparing in the summer, making sure you're eating right, making sure you're tre- treating your body correctly, making sure you're coming to training camp ready, and then during the year, I think it's more of the same of that. But you're doing your job every single day. You're showing up every day. I mean. 
we always used to say the only the only time you feel good for the season is the, uh, before your first workout in the summer. That's the best you feel until the season's over. So I think it's being accountable, playing. I think of it in terms of playing the right way, which is uh, obviously every coach has different little little bit of different ways they they want to play out of their style. But I think accountability is uh, you know making sure that you're being you're you're bringing your best each day inside that team i think uh when you have a, a winning a winning culture that's that's easy to do you know what to do you know what your job is uh and i mean that goes to coaching being honest and telling you what your what your job is that's doing your job every day that's not coming out for a lot of guys that's not scoring uh not scoring you know every night that's coming playing hard every every single night and I think uh when you lose that's, that's it's not acceptable it's not uh that, that's not being accountable when you continue to lose and do the same thing over and over again I think that's uh that, that's something that needs to be looked at I think one way you can account or you can define accountability is if you're in the eighth inning and you're only on your seventh hot dog and your seventh beer you got to <laughs> make it uh, eight and nine you can't call it off and you know not finish the job and hold yourself Absolutely. accountable yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, what kind of accountability did you did you get from your peer set down there, Patrick? Did you feel like quitting at any point? Did they pull you across the finish line? How did you <laughs> did you feel like you had to do it for them? No, I was just though I just from the very start I knew I wanted to finish it. I wasn't going to back down. I if you already make it seven innings, you might as well do nine. You were you're like the Rod Brindamore of nine nine and nine yeah. challengers. Uh, I, I guess I, you I, could think say that. He, I, I think what he says too it makes a good point. Like you're like did your peers pull you through it? No, he wanted to do it. It's him. He wanted he didn't want to let people down. They were they weren't saying anything to him. And I think that's like when you're accountable as a an athlete, you don't want to let the people down that you're 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 yeah. brothers with you're playing with you don't want to let them down you don't want to let yourself down and and that's a, that's a big thing i think uh if you don't care about those guys enough to i don't know say block a shot late in the third period i, saw, I was watching the game the other day guy bailed out missed it was actually in the montreal game last night it was three seconds left in the game for the red wings they pulled their goalie goes out to the point i felt like it was a little bit of bailout three seconds left nothing on the line for minnesota Detroit scores. Does it mean much? No, because they're not going to make the playoffs. But, I mean, if I was a teammate, I'd look at that and be like, this guy just bailed out on the last game of the season, a no-nothing game, or I don't know if they have another game left, but a no-nothing game to Montreal, and he bails out, lets the shot go from the point, they tie it up, end up going in over them. That's accountability. doesn't matter where it is in the season. Matt, uh, when you learn about this 9-9-9 nine, nine, and nine challenge – He's a little ashamed of it, or else he would have probably put his own name to it. <laughs> Obviously, you know, anonymous sourcing, another big sin in in hockey, uh, hockey culture is the anonymous <laughs> source. But um, how accountable do you think Patrick's parents have been when you just see like that he's doing this uh, and, and whether or not they condone this type of behavior? They were with him, apparently. I mean, if if, you know, not apparently, I mean, I've seen the pictures, his own mother and father are right there with him. What do you say to that when in terms of accountability? I'm gonna say I, I love it. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of money in social media these days. So I, I, I love it. I think it's uh some parents with some some good futuristic uh views on how the world is going in social media, they're there's some smart parents. So I, I, I love it. Good well, support. I have, I, always support yeah. always support your kids. There you go. I didn't want to give it away with my question, but I do know Patrick's parents. And uh, that question was for them because I'm sure they'll be listening to the podcast later. <laughs> uh, um, good job. Good, good job supporting them. I hope my son has, hope he can do the nine, nine, nine one day. <laughs> uh, we'll do it one, together. <laughs> one more hockey question for you, Matt, since we're talking about accountability, let's make this kind of comprehensive, but uh, you know, you are, like you say, best friends with Calaposo. You are, uh, a godfather to one of his children. He is he his he and his wife are godparents to one of your children. Close teammates with the Islanders and with the Sabers. He was the captain of the team, but he's also when it comes to the veteran leadership, it was pretty thin. Uh, he 
he, uh, he it's not that he was it. Zemgis Gergensen, obviously, he's a big uh, leader too. Uh, but the youngest team in the National Hockey League, we heard it all year. How how difficult do you think it was for him to be a leader on a team that's so young and other teams, you know, they, it's not just the coach. Sometimes you just need other experienced guys in that locker room who are also playing significant roles. Eric, they added Eric Johnson that didn't work out, but it seemed to be so heavy with the youth. Do you think there needs to be more of a balance in terms of veteran leadership? Um. Well, I definitely think overall there does. I think we've gotten away from that, especially in hockey, just with the salary cap and the entry level deals. It's it's kind of pushed a lot of older guys out. Um, and it, I mean, obviously, with with age comes wisdom. Just because you've been through it, you know, you've been through different situations. You've been through you've been through it all. I remember playing on the Islanders our first time to the playoffs. Uh, we had Marty Reisner in our locker room. We got blown out in the first game against Pittsburgh. We get in the locker room, and this is, for most of us, our first playoff game. And he just sits in the room after the game. He's like, who cares? Like, we lose 10 nothing or one nothing. We're down one nothing in the series. That's it. Who cares? Let's move on. Get ready for the next game. We come out the next. It was kind of like a, a weight off our shoulders where we're just like, yeah, okay, we got blown out. Who cares? One, it only it's only one game in the series, and we came back and won the other game. But I think that was that was a big stress reliever to a lot of us, where we we're kind of we're like, oh god, we're gonna lose this series. He and he he's been through it before. He's been in the league a long time, and it, it helped calm us down. But I think it's experiences like that where you could have great leaders who are young, which I'm sure the Sabers have a lot of great leaders. But they, they just haven't been through it enough to to know the exact circumstances that uh, that are that are happening and and, and how they're going to transpire. So, um, you know, I look back. It was uh, when I went to Hershey. We had a lot of older guys where you could you could see the maturity during games that get closer, important times in the season where these guys have already been through it. It's it's not something new to them. It's not something that they tense up about because they've been through it. So I definitely think it's an, it's an important part to have guys you know, like Kyle and, and, and other guys that have been through it on, on teams. And we've, sports in general has gotten away from that just because the entry-level deals and, and uh, the salary cap. When you were with the Sabres, and I don't think I asked you this question when I did that story when, when I went out to L.A. to, to interview you, because you were still a member of the Sabres organization at the time. Uh, you were just finishing yeah. out your contract. They had, they had loaned you out uh, to uh, Ontario. Um, you went from being one of the core leaders, a guy that was housing Jack Eichel. He was living with you and your family, and it was considered one of the great things that a teammate could do. And he was going to learn from Matt Molson. Uh, and of course, you're, you know, how close you were with Kyle and all those guys. Um, Ted Nolan, you know, love him or hate him. Uh, he's a guy who, uh, embodies a lot when it comes to uh, accountability and leadership and certain things that, uh, he saw that in you, but when you were waived, the Sabres didn't want you in Rochester because they didn't want you to take away shifts from the younger guys. Should that not have been the place that they would put you? I mean, did you think they were? Did they think you were going to be subversive? I don't know. I'm I'm loading up the question too much, but wouldn't the Sabres have been better off to have Matt Molson rubbing off on their young players coming up a few years ago instead of out and working with Kings players? Uh, well, that's where I thought I was going. To be honest with you, I never uh, I never said anything about it. I just assumed that's where I would go once I was waived, and uh, I was kind of left with. Uh, no, you're not going there. Find your own team. So I, thankfully, they're like, I called Mike Futa and Mike Southers right away. And kind of overnight, they were like, yeah, I come here. And I ended up going there and got to play under Mike Southers, who I absolutely love, and kind of brought my love back for the, the game of hockey, which was a great experience. And lived near Jonathan Quick's family, so our kids went to school. 
Um, but I, I assume that, yeah. But uh, so I don't know the answer to why other than what you just said to not go in there. But um, I assumed I was going there the whole time. And I think anyone that knows me well knows that my attitude would have not changed towards helping people try to become good players and be a good teammate. But um, that's obviously not where they wanted me. Yeah, that was always kind of uh, that was counterintuitive to me um, that that they wouldn't want you uh, even in Rochester, um, and I think that you know I I think that that that's that's indicative of what we're seeing come to fruition with the Sabers is uh, in some sports maybe it is okay to go with just youth. All right, we're going to become the youngest team in the league and then build up from there. But after four or five straight years of being one of the two or three youngest teams in the league, you know, at some point you start to bear the fruit of just the total inexperience. You need to learn from someone. Like you say, you need to learn how to be accountable. You need to learn how to win. Uh, the Sabres had a coaching staff this past season, and I'm sure it'll change, but who had no playoff experience with the exception of their goaltender coach who'd won a couple of Stanley Cups, but their – their head coach, their power play guy, their penalty kill guy, and their video coach had never experienced um, the playoffs above the ECHL level. Anyways, I'm not going on a rant or trying to draw you into that, Matt, but it's just uh, at some point the you know the youth you gotta it's it's one youth it sounds great it sounds great to be the youngest whatever have the most prospects or whatever, but if you don't have the the veteran leadership to go along with it, it gets wasted. Um. Patrick, any questions for uh, Matt Molson before we wrap up here? The man whose identity you've so shamelessly <laughs> stolen. Um, I'm just happy someone would actually pick my face for their Twitter <laughs> uh, account. So I, 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 I'm, I'm thankful for that. I don't, I don't think I have any questions, but um, he's got a 26 think... Dali in his background instead of a 26 Molson. I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't <laughs> even let him have that Molson picture. <laughs> I don't want to break your heart, but I actually have two Darlene jerseys up there. Holy shit. <laughs> one of them's from uh, the uh, World Juniors, the Sweden one. All right, fair enough. Maybe Matt, 26 will be up in the rafter someday, Matt. All I got to do is just I'll replace just, the nameplate. All right, I'll have to send them one. I think I got one of the old yellow jerseys I can send you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Darlene's jersey. coming right down if you send me one of those. <laughs> <laughs> You were going to say, Patrick, you had something you, or something you were going to oh, say. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I think everything has just come, I guess, full circle because um, when the first game that Matt had ever played for the Sabres, I went to the game with my grandpa. And if I remember correctly, you scored two goals that game. Yeah, if I could have boiled that up with my Sabre tenure, I would have had a good, good yeah, run. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they don't ask you how they ask you how many. Yeah, if I, if I would have had Teddy Nolan for the whole time, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing this, guys. Um, Matt, I know you're – where are you, by the way? You say you're on vacation, but you didn't uh, tell me where. Yeah, I'm in, oh, I'm in Naples. All right. Florida. Yeah. Well, enjoy the weather down there, and hopefully the, the golf courses are treating you well. So far, um, so good. If you're feeling itchy about uh, nine, nine and nine, uh, I don't know if there's a ballpark around there. Maybe there's a, a a spring training site nearby with extended, you know, the veterans are still working out, trying to get in shape or that, you know, a ball, uh, you know, rookie eight rookie league might be down there. I don't know. You're going to give it a shot. The nine, nine, nine. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I mean, I don't know the last time I've been to a baseball game, but uh I mean, the first nine, the beers I got down, it's the uh, hot dogs that I got the problem with. So, well, I'll have to do some training for that. All right. Well, nine and nine. I can do that, too, I think. I'm pretty confident <laughs> yeah. in myself. Patrick, thanks for doing this. Matt, thank you for doing it. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's good to see your face, Matt, even though you seem like you're a little in disguise. I think people are going to reach out and probably say it's not really yeah. you, but that's all right. Uh, Sun's coming in right here. But uh, – means a lot to me that uh, that you'd come in and say hi to Patrick and Patrick it means a lot to me that you'd take time out of your out of your day to to join this uh, rinky dink podcast. Yeah, thanks guys. Well, it's a pleasure meeting the guy behind my face. There you go. <laughs> pleasure it. meeting the him. guy whose face it is. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Keep keep 
keep making me more popular than I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> For everybody out there listening, don't go anywhere because after this break, Jonah and I are going to come back and talk about the Sabres, about Kevin Adams' news conference on Tuesday, and player reaction from Locker Cleanout, uh, where Jonah was uh, today talking to the Sabres players, uh, their thoughts on the coaching staff and uh, what's going on at uh, Seymour Knox Plaza. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716 716- 630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Our thanks again to Patrick Tierney and Matt Molson for joining us here on Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. It was nice bonus to be able to ask Matt uh, about what's been going on with the Sabres. Um, I had, uh, scheduled that appearance, uh, before Don Granado had gotten fired. Uh, so that way we could surprise Patrick. Um, but, uh, some bonus insights there, Jonah, you were out at the, um, press conference on Tuesday, Kevin Adams, uh, talking about the decision to fire Don Granado and a couple of assistant coaches. Uh, and then you're out there again today for locker clean out. I guess I'll just, you're as a, a man on the scene type question, what's just your general observations on the, the vibe, the temperature in the room, that type of thing? Well, it's quite a bit different than it was a year ago. Uh, and, you know, the Sabres had a worse season, but only by a handful of points, a handful of fewer wins and missed the playoffs again, this time not by one victory, but only by a couple of points and, and a few choice games but the vibe and the mood was a lot different a lot more regret and maybe sorrow is too strong of a word but it had that kind of feel as if uh you know an opportunity was lost and there was kind of a melancholy sadness about the Sabres not being um as good as they were supposed to be this year whereas last year there was a lot of hopefulness and especially with Kevin Adams and Don Granato, even kind of a bristling at the suggestion that the Sabres missed an opportunity and should feel badly about the way the season went a year ago when the playoff drop continuing. There was this, um, I think Don Granato called it absolute conviction last year that the Sabres would be in the playoffs. Now this coming season, 23-24, and the Sabres were not in the playoffs and Don Granato was not able to uh, come back and have another season-ending press conference like he did a year ago. And while there was a, a strain of this, um, you know, you remember when Ken Dorsey got fired during the season and it almost felt like, uh, you know, a, a wake at, at Oneville's Drive for a day, how, um, you know, heartbroken this, the Bills players seemed to be that they let down Ken Dorsey. And, you know, they, they even said at Josh Allen that they got him fired by the way the offense played. There was a strain of that from the Sabres players, but not a lot. It didn't. It seemed like they understood that uh, missing the playoffs again with this group, this group together now for the third year and the thirteenth of the franchise, was worthy of a uh, coaching change, and that uh, they could have maybe saved Don Granado's job by winning. But because they didn't, uh, they didn't seem terribly surprised that uh, management and ownership decided to make a change. To that point, Jonah, I found it striking uh, that Alex Tuck. Uh, was kind of jokingly talking about Lindy Ruff and how cool it would be because he grew up watching the Sabres. And of course he didn't say, uh, you know, that he wanted Lindy or anything like that. He was just, uh, he was asked the question as somebody who grew up as a Sabres fan, what would you think if Lindy Ruff were coming back? And I think that in most cases, an athlete in that situation would say, Hey, look, I, you know, we're, I'm just thinking about Don or, you know, it's too soon for that. Uh, Alex Tuck was ready to jump in with both skates 
on that idea uh, and whoever else, like he even said, and you know, hey, whoever they bring in here, I'll, I'm sure I'll be. But it was not the most deferential answer to Don Granado. That's that's what I took away from that. I just thought it was interesting that they were like, at to as you were saying, the players are just ready to move on. Like we need, we know we need a new voice. We know we need to change. And they were taking some of the blame too. They weren't saying it's all Don's fault. In fact, that was one of the quotes: "Was it's on us just as much." But yeah, I, I found that uh, to be a, a, a pretty uh, fascinating answer from Alex Tuck regarding who might be the next coach. Um, and he was asked directly about Gerard Gallant, too, who he okay. played for in Vegas. And then Alex Tuck made a joke about, hey, can you throw another name at me? Because I think he was taken a little off guard or seemed to act as if he had not thought about any of these possibilities and was put on the spot, maybe a bit having to answer that question but spoke very highly of both coaches and seems to indicate that he would embrace either one of those individuals um but you know i don't know if that means he was endorsing anybody in particular i think he just uh, answered the questions honestly and it would seem that at least alex tuck would be happy with either his former coach or the coach of the team he grew up rooting for oh for sure I, and he's not a young player he's a veteran Maybe the next captain. I don't know. But I just, I was just surprised that he didn't say, hey, that's a question for another time, or I don't want to talk about that. He was ready just to, yeah, like you say, throw some names at me. Let's see, let's spitball it here. Um, I'm also interested in the organization's decision not to fire the entire coaching staff. They made it a point to retain goaltending coach Mike Bales. And that seems to make sense. He's won Stanley Cups in the past. And with what happened with UPL, strides were made. I get it. But the decision to not fire the assistant coaches, uh, Matt Ellis and Marty Wilford, I don't get it. Um, it's just, you know, now maybe that's going to be up to the next coach. But I think that Matt Ellis's fingerprints are all over the Sabres' recent woes. The power play, of course, was abysmal this year. That's what he coaches. Marty Wilford's the defensive coach. These are guys with no pedigree, uh, with no history of any kind of success at any level, um, in terms of coaching, that is. Um, neither of them have been to the NHL playoffs. Um I don't know. I just thought that was a strange thing to fire some of the assistants and not all of them. To me, it seems like um, short-sighted, a little small time to me. Well, I, I think there's a couple ways to look at it. Kevin Adams was asked directly about that decision and indicated that you know the coaches you mentioned would be staying on the staff but might be reassigned in their roles. I don't know if that perhaps even means non-coaching capacities or front office roles or something like that. I think one way to look at it is these are individuals that Kevin Adams had a role in hiring and putting onto the coaching staff and maybe he still believes in. Or also the other side of that coin that it did seem like Don Granado was relieved of his duties along with Don Granado's loyalists and chief lieutenants, that the coaches and assistants that had to go with Don Granado were let go that day and maybe a new coach comes in and makes further changes on the staff, or maybe, uh, you know, Kevin Adams spoke in some coded ways yesterday that might lead you to believe that he already knows who he's going to hire, that if he hasn't already had those conversations, he's already had it plotted out in his head and he knows who he's going to go after. And maybe that person wants these coaches on the staff or Kevin Adams believes these coaches fit with what that coach will want on his staff. And if, you know, I don't think it's going to be Seth Appert because of what Kevin Adams said about wanting an experienced NHL coach. And I don't think he would have said that so forcefully if he had a plan to uh, promote someone who was not an experienced NHL coach. But that would fit well if he already knew that Seth Appert was taking over and Seth Appert had already said, yes, I like this guy and I like that guy. Uh, you know, keep them in place. I think we can win with them doing things a little bit differently. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, especially if he does have his next coach earmarked and they've had a discussion, Hey, you know, do you want to keep these guys? Why we're not going to fire them if you want to keep them around. 
Uh, so that way we don't go through the yo-yo situation of firing the guy and then bringing him back. Matt Ellis did play for Lindy Ruff. Uh, Marty Wilford, I don't know if there's a connection with uh, with Lindy Ruff there. I mean, Lindy Ruff, uh, a lot of people are talking about it and for obvious reasons, but it makes the most sense. Uh, he's going to want the job. He applied for the job. He interviewed for the job that Ralph Kruger got. Uh, I'm sure that he's been bitter with the organization over that. Things went well for him in New Jersey for the most part. And now he has a chance to come home. It's where his kids were born. I don't know if he still has the home in Spalding Lake. Uh, maybe I should know that. Or maybe they, I mean, they might have moved. Maybe they, but anyways, I think he and his wife, Gay, might still have their place here. Um, his son works in the organization, Brent Ruff. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense. Do the Sabres go through the dog and pony show of pretending like they're doing interviews? They probably at least should have done that with Kevin Adams. But I asked uh, Terry Pagula that question on that Zoom call with he and Kim back when they fired uh, Jason Bottrell. And uh, he did flat out say, no, we did not do a, a GM search. And that was his way of saying, we know that we have the right guy. It, that hasn't necessarily worked out. So probably at least for PR purposes, it would be a good idea for the. Although now that I think about it, all the different coaches, I mean, maybe not Bilesma, but the Granado LaFontaine thing, there was no coaching search. It was just, we're doing this. And then, you know, now it's not. It, at times they've done it, but uh, they've done a search. But a lot of times since Terry Pagula bought the Sabres, it's just been, this is what we're doing. This is what I've decided. We're bringing in Ted Nolan and Pat LaFontaine. We're bringing in, um, Kevin Adams. We're bringing in, there's another one that I think was kind of, that was Don Granado, but was anybody do, was there a coaching search with Don Granado? No, he was an interim and just kind of one. He just won him over. He, he did uh it was an on the job interview, I guess. And he, well, they, they interviewed some other coaches and they took a while. So I think there was some semblance of a search, but it did seem like Don Granado was the choice at the beginning. And then at the end, you know, they walked themselves right back to him. They've hired so many coaches and also a lot of these, coaching changes have come with a general manager getting fired alongside of them and a, and a change in that leadership structure there. So uh, general managers making their first head coach hire has been different than general managers making their second coach hire. And I think ownership's been very involved sometimes and maybe less involved other times. Uh, one thing I think about Lindy Ruff, I think Lindy Ruff makes a lot of sense organizationally in Sabres culture and things like that. And there's even a sentiment of maybe writing a wrong and bringing him back home, um, doing this for Lindy Ruff and for the fan base and for, you know, the Sabres culture, as I mentioned, as a whole. I don't know if it makes the most sense of a hire for Kevin Adams. And if you take everything he said yesterday at face value and the things he emphasized and even his body language, it seems like this is, this is a very important hire for Kevin Adams. He has to get it right or he won't be the general manager to make the next hire. And they really have to win next year or I think Kevin Adams is very much on the hot seat. And he seems to really uh, either know exactly who he wants or knows, as he said, a crystal clear idea of the type of coach he wants. And if it's Lindy Ruff, that really looks like a Terry Pagula hire and, and a hire that was made for Kevin Adams. And if it's really anybody else in the league, it's going to look like Kevin Adams went out and got his guy. I don't so know I don't about know. that. Uh, I mean, the first part. I mean, the second part I agree with. The first part, is it a Terry P I mean. Uh, Kevin, there is a strange dynamic with Kevin Adams working uh, or hiring his former boss. You know, Lindy Ruff clearly has way more experience, has way more hockey wherewithal, expertise. He's been there, done that. Probably if you were to rank all the people who could be the next Sabres general manager, people would take Lindy Ruff over Kevin Adams, even though Kevin Adams has actual general manager experience. Um, or Lindy Ruff as a president of hockey operations type thing. People would not flinch at that. So to have a situation, at least in the Sabres under their current infrastructure, where the coach answers to the general manager, that is a strange dynamic, but it's not totally foreign. We've seen it before where a former player becomes 
the assistant coach or a position coach of somebody they used to play with, you know, this guy used to be my teammate. Now he's my boss. Um, you know, I'm sure it's happened a bunch of times in hockey because of the way things work with roles, uh, in that league, uh, where an assistant becomes, uh, you know, the, what do they say? The student becomes the master, uh, type thing. So, yeah, I do think that's a little awkward, but it also seems to me they've worked together before. I think Lindy Ruff's the type of guy who would swallow his pride. He wanted, he would have been, had Kruger, had the had the Sabres hired Lindy Ruff and not Ralph Kruger, uh, he would have been working for Jason Bottrell, his former player. Uh, in fact, his former minor league player, a guy who, um, uh, a guy who couldn't even stick at the NHL level. He kept, he was mostly in Rochester when he was in the Sabres organization. So that would have been an interesting dynamic too. And maybe it played a part in the, in the organization's decision, not to hire Lindy that they needed to bring somebody uh, who, who, who was uh, not of that, um, of the, of, not of that dynamic. Um, but I, I think that this could be Kevin Adams's choice. He could want Lindy Ruff. He wants to win. I mean, he wants it to work. Uh, and he needs to get this next coach right, or else he's hired two coaches and failed both times. Um, Lindy seems to be the safest pick. He seems to be what the doctor ordered in terms of style, in terms of what the players are even saying. Um, I don't know. I want to double check. I mean, who was when they fired Phil Housley? Was that Bob? That's when they. Ralph Kruger came in after that. Right. But I'm just saying who would the, I'm trying, there were so many general managers. It's hard for me to. That was a Bowsma hire. He hired Housley and Kruger. And then the general manager change came while Bob Kruger Troll, was still mean. the coach. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just want to double check on that. Um, what, what are there any, any other takeaways from locker clean out or the news conference? Uh, just to the back to the player accountability thing, we talked about this a lot with Matt Molson, but um, that was really the strain and, and the buzz of a lot of the player comments. It's something Kevin Adams said yesterday that these players want to be pushed. And I don't know if that's something that you would have heard from this locker room a year or two ago, maybe when they were younger players and, and hadn't had as many hard times in the league. And even the previous group of players with Jack Eichel and Sam Reinhardt that didn't seem to ever really embrace hard coaching, at least during their Sabres tenure. Uh, but this team seems to understand that they didn't make the playoffs doing things a certain way. And while they were on the surface, quite respectful to Don Granato, there were things that uh, many of the players that spoke today, Tate Thompson probably had the strongest words mentioned about, you know, needing at times players to get benched or scratched or have their ice time reduced for making mistakes. And that, they couldn't keep making the same errors and playing the same way and just try to develop into a winning hockey team, that there will need to be some standards and some accountability. And I think, I think that's what accountability really means. It comes down to if you don't do the right things, what are the consequences and whether it's your teammates or the coaching staff or the system or the structure, what happens to a player if he doesn't do what he's being held accountable to do? And the Sabres, even though Don Granato said the players had internal accountability, they were accountable to themselves, there was never much external accountability. If players turned the puck over or had a poor effort, uh, you didn't really see – a few times you did, but you didn't really see them scratched or lose their opportunities uh, too often. And when it did happen, it seemed to come around too late. I think that just wasn't really baked into the culture of the team over the past couple of seasons. That really stood out to me when Kevin Adams said that they noted the lack of accountability as far back as training camp. I mean, I don't know if he was just in throw Don under the bus mode at that point in the news conference, or if he said something maybe he wishes he shouldn't have, but that does not reflect well on Kevin Adams that they recognized this even before the season began. And then they got off to the start that they did. And he sat on his hands. Now, of course he's taking uh, Terry Pagula's lead and Terry says, no, we're staying the course. We're not making this move. I mean, obviously that gets Kevin Adams off the hook, but it either reflects poorly on Kevin Adams, Terry Pagula or both. 
that they were just willing to let it happen. And, um, and maybe that changes things too, with the hierarchy. And that, that was the other part of what I was going to say. I, and I, I, I talked my way too far afield, but, uh, regarding the structure and how the, the organizational structure where uh, with the bills, the head coach and the general manager independently report to Terry Pagula with the Sabres. It has always been the head coach answers to the general manager. The general manager answers to Terry Pagula. I wonder if they were to bring in somebody with a lot of experience, somebody like um, a, a Lindy Roth, uh, or let's just throw out, you know, if, if the, if the hurricanes don't resign uh, Rod Brindamore and Brindamore joins his old buddy, Kevin Adams, uh, you know, somebody who's got a lot of uh, experience that they don't massage that organizational flow chart to where the coach answers to Terry Pagula, similarly to the football team. Um, or I wonder if they give the head coach an additional title, something like uh, head coach and assistant GM, head coach and something of hockey operations. Uh, I don't know. There's all kinds of different things that that could be. And whoever interviews for the job and the Sabres want them badly enough, their agent could say, you know, we want some sort of provisions that, you know, some sort of uh, quasi organizational control. Uh, if, if my client is going to take this job, because uh, we don't know that you have the entire faith in your general manager. Just these are, these yeah. are things that happen. I mean, I'm not saying that I know anything, uh, but these are things that happen. You see it in the National Football League all the time. You want that head coach enough? You want that hot young candidate or the the guy, you know, let's say, you know, one of these the thoughts I always had about Bill Belichick narrative, uh, no team wants Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick, uh, everybody's staying away from Bill Belichick. I think it's possible that Bill Belichick was saying, I'm not going to join your organization unless I have final say on the roster. And they're like, no, we have a general manager. Okay, well, that's the way I operate. That's the way I operated in New England, and that's what I require for you to hire me as a coach. That all kind of, This happens a lot in sports happens in the net in the NBA too. Right. I mean, it's, if you want to, if you, whatever your leverage is, you try to maximize it. And some, some of these coaches that the Sabres might be looking at might want to have some, uh, some semblance of organizational control worked into their contract. Um, no. Yeah, perhaps. I think the Sabres have had versions of that. It sort of maybe developed into that way with Ralph Kruger. I just don't know. Even though uh, Kevin Adams had spoke yesterday that Terry Fagula is just as engaged as ever, uh, that they conversate regularly about the hockey club, I don't know if Terry Fagula is really going to be as involved in the coaching search to kind of make that side deal with a coach without Kevin Adams' input. Uh, maybe that will be what's required to get the very best coach. If it's Rob Brindamore, if that's who they want, maybe Kevin Adams understands they'll have to give him uh, a share of the power. But it seems to me just based on the way Kevin Adams spoke yesterday, that this really does seem to be Kevin Adams' big move to make the big hire, to put the team into the playoffs. And even though the coach will get a lot of credit for being the coach that leads them to the playoffs, I think from a executive organizational standpoint, it will be Kevin Adams hired the coach and put him in position. And at this point, it's now a team of players that Kevin Adams has put together the whole roster. So it's really his show for now. And either they make the playoffs or they don't. I think, you know, they make a change in management eventually if this doesn't work out. And I, it was also, I mean, there always is, but there was definitely a performance element to Kevin Adams' press conference yesterday um, with the new COO, uh, Pete Quelly, in the room and everybody watching, everybody in the Sabres fan base and, and people paying attention to the franchise, watching him speak live on either television or live streams. Um, you know, they have a new scoreboard being built and a new roof and new upgrades with the arena i think they need to sell tickets and fill the building next year and and change that trajectory of the franchise which, which comes along with winning but also there's work to be done there that i think goes separate from just winning games on the ice and there needs to be new messaging and new rhetoric and change is really what they're going to be selling this summer even if they don't make wholesale changes on the roster but the coach and the messaging and just kind of the feel around the team 
is going to have to be different to get the fan base excited to get back in the building and, and try to fill that place more often with Sabres fans, not visiting fans next season. Here's a thought exercise. Had the Sabres decided to fire Kevin Adams also, who does the press conference yesterday? Because we're not hearing from Terry I mean, Pagula. And I'm asking that question and, it, you know, just wondering. Well, is Kevin Adams still thing. around because he somebody had to answer the questions? I and, think, and the new COO can't because he just started yesterday or whenever the fuck he did? I think it would have to be him or it would have to be whoever pulled the trigger on that move, if not Terry Pagula himself. He's and not going to give a news conference. But here's the thing. Terry Pagula, I guess it's his prerogative as the owner to not speak to the media. But he's also the team president. So if he's not answering any of these questions or answering any of these moments when the team president needs to face the public, then he shouldn't be the team president anymore. And there should be somebody in that place that that makes those decisions and also answers to them when they need to happen. So it really, if that was the case, then it would have had to be Terry Pagula at the microphone. And if not Terry Pagula, then whoever Terry Pagula's surrogate is now, which might be the COO, and he's in his first week on the job. Yeah, I, just something I thought of yesterday. I mean, do when, you think the COO had a role in deciding to move on from Don Granado is, is one of his first orders of business? It's not his side of the organization. I'm sure he but, was involved in the discussions. I'm not saying that he had any influence at all, but he was, I'm sure, a part of of the discussions, Um, even if he's sitting there listening. I I would be shocked if he wasn't. There's no that's his job. I mean, he is there to be. I don't think it's not because it's not a hockey operations. This it's it's that well, it was an organizational. It was a big right. decision. What was it a move the Sabers had to make for marketing purposes? Even if there's a hockey justification where you think maybe this can work next year with Don Granado as the coach, it seemed like it had to be made uh, for the sake of the Sabers fans and marketing. I guess I answered my own question. But. I don't think I don't think it had to because if they really were worried about tickets, they would have fired him when, early this season when they saw that nobody was coming to the games. No matter, it didn't matter how exciting last season was and that they came close and Tage and Devin Levi and Darlene got off to a decent statistical start and all these guys, these young players, it wasn't generating anything at the box office. It, there was no translation to actual tickets being sold and they weren't winning. So that would have been the time to make the move. If it was going to be a marketing thing. Uh, now peak Welly wasn't involved at the time. He didn't as he's the former uh, chief business officer of the New York giants. He was finishing up there. He just started uh, just a few days ago. I I don't know. I, it would be total speculation on my part I, that Pete Guelli came in and, and convinced Terry Pagula, even if even if he didn't say Don Granado's got to go, just to say, hey, look, the things have to change around here. The ID needs to change. The the culture, the vibe, the whole thing. Um, so were those discussions that were had, perhaps? But I just think that if it was about selling tickets, Terry Pagula would have made the move five months ago. My second part of that is Peak Welly just got involved. And again, I, see, now, now I'm down the road just on I'd speak, I don't want to make it seem like Peak Welly talked Terry Pagula into it because I I have zero insight on that. Just we're just talking out loud here, and which could be dangerous. But um Yeah, I don't know if they told Kevin Adams to if anybody told Kevin Adams he had to make that move. I just think from the marketing side of things, uh, the Sabres needed this move to happen in order for that uh, endeavor to succeed going forward. Yeah, they have to turn the page. And Terry Pagula has been easily influenced before by nostalgia. So Lindy Ruff certainly makes sense. This is a guy who brought in LaFontaine and Ted Nolan out of nowhere, uh, just seemingly because, and Phil Housley and... You know, he's made these types of moves. I had a point I was going to make, too, regarding um, the marketing part of it, and it's uh, it's escaped me. So, um, I don't know. 
well, you got a whole summer or, you know, however many weeks before we have a new coach to talk about. Maybe not. Maybe they're hiring a new coach Monday. When would be the perfect time to hire the coach? Do you want to do it Monday? Because once you get a little further in the week, it's NFL draft week, right? And then you're dealing with draft picks and the first rounders in town. And then you have rookie camp. And if you want to get the biggest bang for your PR buck, when do you announce your new head coach? If you're the same, I think you got Monday and Tuesday of next week, maybe even into Wednesday before the draft starts. And then last year, the bills took a week off, I believe between the draft and the rookie mini camp. So there is a dead week there. But I also don't think the Sabres can worry about that. I mean, you probably avoid Thursday and Friday in the middle of the NFL draft, but rookie minicamp or some of these days in the off seasons, I don't think the Sabres can worry at all about what the Bills are doing. Or you, And it can just take the playbook from Kanishas, which really doesn't care who's doing what, announcing all their coaching hires right in the middle of newsworthy Sabres days or in the middle of an eclipse and just letting the chips fall where they may that, that way. Yeah. All right, Jonah, let's wrap it up here. Uh, we'll come back uh, in a couple of days, talk some bills. Uh, they are going to meet with the media for the first time since the Stefan Diggs trade. Uh, that's going to be Thursday. So we'll hear from Josh Allen. Uh, we'll hear from Sean McDermott for the first time since the Stefan Diggs trade and some other players. Brandon Bean's going to also speak Thursday. We have heard from him. Uh, but anyway, we'll have something to talk about regarding the Bills. Uh, and thank you out there to everyone for listening to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. We'll